Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you, Marcy, for sharing our slides. Uh, you did such a wonderful job introducing us that I don't believe we need to do much more of that. Marcy, is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on to talking about the power of AAC? I'm, I'm good. Let's get started. All right, let's jump in. So, um, as Emily said, I am Tana, and so I'm going to be starting us off today, and then um, our Marcy and I will kind of tag team the presentation. But um, as we get going, we're really going to try to hit on some of these discussion points, um, give everybody in the audience an overview of some AEC tools and strategies, um, and then also just kind of paint a picture of what are the communication skills um, and challenges with those skills for children with CP, and in turn, what is the role of AEC in the lives of children with CP or individuals with CP? And our main message today is really to help um, anyone who may be new or even familiar with AEC to understand that AEC is a really powerful intervention that we can use to support some positive social and academic outcomes for our, our children with CP. Um, and it's even more powerful when it's introduced very early on in development. Next slide, please, Marcy. So let's start with just a little definition here. Uh, it's a long definition actually on the slide, but we'll try to break it down a little bit more. Um, AUC is actually uh, augmentative and alternative communication, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as augmentative communication. Uh, just to try to shorten it and making it less of a mouthful, I think. Um, but it's really an umbrella term that we use for all of the tools and strategies um, that we use to support communication. Um, and we use these tools not only to support expressive communication or the ability to communicate your thoughts and ideas to others, but also understanding of the communication of others. So we consider AEC um, and all of the tools under that umbrella to be both receptive communication supports and expressive communication supports. And Marcy's going to talk a little bit about those two pieces of the language system, the receptive and expressive pieces. Um, our AAC supports under that umbrella also are used to supplement, in some cases, um, the communication needs of a, of a verbal communicator. So they may not be the only means that that communicator uses. He or she may use speech as well. Um, or in some cases, AAC tools are used to replace natural communication through speech or writing. Um, and we want to emphasize as we're talking through the uh, technology and strategy piece today that the whole umbrella of AAC really is not only about the tools, which is usually what's more at the surface and, and usually what families and um, other professionals and other disciplines kind of know about AAC is, is that technology. But we also want to emphasize here the strategies, um, not only the intervention strategies, but the communication support strategies that go along with working with um, children and individuals who use EAC. So when we talk about those things that fall under this umbrella, um, we have both unaided supports and aided supports. Uh, and as you can see by the visual here on the slide, our unaided supports really are those options that involve no external technology of any kind. Uh, they're really just strategies that rely solely on the human body. And I'm using a lot of these unaided supports when I talk. Um, I'm an East Coaster, so I use my hands a lot. So uh, as you can see, my, my gestures are, of course, unaided communication support. Um, and gesture use can be really general gestures, such as the one I'm using here, or they can be pretty personalized to an individual communicator. Um, and developing those unaided uh, tools via gesture might be part of our intervention for an individual with cerebral palsy, helping to come up with a personalized set of gestures that can serve a purpose in their communication um, toolbox. These gestures might also be symbolic, such as reaching up, it's kind of universal for that idea of raising up or picking someone up, or they might be rather non-symbolic, such as turning your head to the side um, to mean per perhaps something different for one person over another. So when we talk about the symbolism of gestures, we're really talking about how they fit in into the conventions of what our family culture and our larger culture might understand. And there is a place for both those um, conventional or symbolic gestures and those per more personalized gestures in the, in the communication toolbox of our, of our communicators with CP. Some other examples of unaided might be things like pointing. Of course, we do this as communicators or even gaining attention through sound, like clicking your tongue or making a vocalization like ah to get somebody to come to your room. 
You might tap a shoulder to get someone's attention or start a conversation or even raise your hand. And all of those things are considered uh, unaided forms of communication support. We also have things like signing. American Sign Language and Signing Exact English, facial expressions and finger spelling that all fall under this unaided support category. On the flip side, um, aided, as the image suggests, is really those tools that exist outside of the human body, and it's a range of tools other than just the human body. And we're going to explore uh, some of those in a moment here, and then again later on in the slides as we start taking a look at what AAC looks like in action. Some of those tools might include things like picture boards or communication boards, communication books, um, PECs or picture exchange communication systems, which some individuals in the audience might be familiar with. Um, and then things like writing and drawing. Um, and of course, voice output technology, which is um, very um, on the market now and out in the, in the public eye for most of us. And we'll be talking about that as well. All right, next slide, please. So just like with us, uh, communication occurs in many ways for our children and individuals who use AAC. Uh, and the type of AAC that a child or an individual may use is really dependent on things um, such as the child's environment that they're in in the moment, um, the partner that they're communicating with, the position that their body is in in that moment. Sometimes certain positions lend themselves better to using technology versus other positions, right? If you imagine how different body control is sitting in a wheelchair that's supported versus sitting on the couch at home. So a child or an individual may use a different tool depending on that body position or perhaps their state. If they're feeling tired or ill. Uh, they may be less able to use some of their higher technology and may rely more on some of those unaided communication strategies. Sometimes it's also a matter of what tools are available at the time. So uh, an individual who wants to participate in swimming, for example, might not be able to take a high tech system into the swimming pool with them, right? So having that other tool available that may be more of a light tech, which we're gonna talk about here in a moment, or an unneeded form of communicating during that particular moment is what's available for that individual. And then the type of communication used also depends on the purpose of that communication. Um, we have many individuals we work with with cerebral palsy who get along just fine communicating with gestures and even um, approximate speech with their familiar partners. But they may find it harder to be understood out in the community with partners that are less familiar and may then use different tools to help their communication be successful. In our AAC intervention, then, the, the point here is we really want to encourage this idea of multimodal communication and incorporating a lot of AAC tools that are appropriate for that individual, both unaided and unaided, depending on all of these factors. Next slide, please. So this slide kind of paints a picture of some of these main categories of technology. At the very top here, we'll talk about this idea of dedicated tech, which really is speech generating devices that are dedicated to the purpose of communication only. Um, and this means that they don't serve other computer functions, um, or if they have the capacity to do so, those functions have been locked and are not available to the user. Um, these types of devices are often sold by major AAC companies, such as Prinky Romic Company or Sotillo or Toby Dynavox, which are systems you might see coming through for different individuals. And they're considered durable medical equipment or DME, um, meaning that they are ruggedized in some way, protected by the, uh, from the elements, um, and likely will be uh, covered by insurance if we submit a request for that type of equipment. In contrast to that, we think about integrated technology as really technology that not only serves perhaps a communication purpose, but it serves another purpose, a more everyday usage purpose. So these types of integrated systems are available to all of us at the moment. We use things like phones and tablets and laptop computers, um, and those types of systems can actually run applications or apps that are tailored to communication. And so an individual who has an integrated system would have access to not only all of the features available on that phone or tablet, but also whatever communication system options are available on the application that's running on that system. 
Integrated systems are not usually covered by insurance payers and are not usually considered durable medical equipment, but there are some workarounds uh, with that that our teams try to try to address as those needs come up for individuals. At the bottom here, we have uh, what's called light tech technology, and as the name suggests, this is tools that are really more simplistic in their technology. They're not unaided. They don't just involve the body. They do involve some external tool, but it might be a tool such as print, right? Something printed on a page or in a book or even a very basic voice output button um, that an individual might press that has a message. So some examples of these might be things like communication books and boards, as we mentioned before, or switches like uh, Big Macs or little step-by-steps and other types of switches that resemble that old Staples easy button that everybody might know about. Same idea, you press the button and it says something. So a child relying on AEC might use a combination of this technology um, along with communication strategies learned in their intervention and education settings throughout his or her lifetime. Next slide, please. And what we really wanna focus on here is that AEC is really that system of tools, as we talked about earlier, that, that system of multimodal tools and strategies that help us build a bridge uh, for our communicators between uh, where they are in a successful and independent communication opportunity, right? And so our intervention really is aiming to support children with these needs um, and focusing on identifying effective tools and strategies and teaching communicators and their partners how to integrate those tools into everyday communication opportunities. So when we're approaching care for children with cerebral palsy and individuals who come to us needing support with AEC supports, we always take this idea of using the same underlying principles that we would use for language development in a child without cerebral palsy, but really understanding and applying and integrating those nuances that are involved in, in using technology to achieve these types of communication goals. Next slide. So we need to start early. We know this for sure. It's never too late to introduce AAC, but it is always a good idea to start as early as possible. Um, we know that AAC is an evidence-based first-line strategy for communication intervention for young children. And our research really supports that AAC does not hinder the development of speech, even if it's introduced very early at the beginning stages of language acquisition for, for young children. So we really want to get in there early, and we know that our, our children with cerebral palsy can present with many different types of impacts, um, which Marcy will, will talk about shortly, but we always need to presume competence and potential in our communicators. We know that there's really no prerequisites to learning communication as a human, right? And therefore, there's no prerequisites to AAC, and that includes using some of these higher tech forms of AAC. We also need to provide, however, appropriate communication learning opportunities and support. You know, the tools are not magic. We can't just set them down and expect that their existence in the environment um, or some process of osmosis is going to help our individuals learn how to use them for communication. So success really comes from understanding that there is a teaching process involved, just like with any skill. Next slide. So we've talked a lot about what AAC is. Uh, we've talked a little bit about um, how we approach using AAC as a, as a tool for language and communication development. But let's talk a little bit about why we use AAC. Um, and here are some just general functions and benefits that AAC technology provides. But Marcy's going to touch a little bit more on some of the systems impacted, the communication systems impacted by CP, and how AAC might support those specific systems. Um, at the very top here, we know that AAC provides a voice that can be received uh, by a wide range of partners. And some of our children with CP um, are not developing a voice. And we know how important it is for them to have an outwardly spoken voice in order to connect with certain partners. It also repairs communication breakdowns when a communicator may have a voice, but perhaps it's not understood by all partners. It supports communications in moments of high emotion. Um, and it also really helps ease such some situational demands along that same line. 
Um, and we know it supports comprehension as well. We have a lot of great evidence that um, helps us see how the use of visual language can really help individuals develop a better understanding of what they're hearing. AAC use also supports literacy development, and it does this through really uh, providing an opportunity for language learning and competence. And it promotes independence and engagement by providing access to language as well. Uh, we know that language really mediates so much of what we do as human beings, right? Reading and writing, math and building relationships, advocating for ourselves, and even emotionally regulating. It all is mediated by language. So in AAC intervention, we really aim to provide access to language for children with CP through these AAC supports. And then through that access, we really hope to broaden access for those skills and opportunities, those academic and social skills and opportunities that we know are so important to quality of life. You're on, Marcy. Thanks, Tana. Um, so we're going to segue a little bit and um, move away from AAC to discuss communication and communication development in general, um, and then how CP impacts communication development. Uh, I also am an East Coaster, and so I talk with my hands, um, which I I never realized, Tana, you too um, are the talk with your hands East Coaster. So here we go. Um, on this slide, there are five buckets. Um, starting at the bottom left is the uh, term speech production. So we're going to define our terms that we as speech pathologists use when we talk about communication. So speech production, um, sometimes people think, oh, it's talking, it's, it's the sounds, um, but it's more than just that. Speech production includes the breath, uh, the respiration, the voice, the phonation, and then the ability to make sounds or the articulation and how that is coordinated in order to produce speech. Um, another term that we use in the field of speech pathology is phonological de development, and that is the way that kids acquire sounds. And another term that we use under this umbrella of speech production is um, voice or fluency. And so these are the qualities of pitch, rate, speed, intonation, um, how smoothly you can talk, how you can modulate your volume. And so all of those qualities um, fall under the umbrella of speech production. We have another term moving up just above that to speech intelligibility. And speech intelligibility is um, now how speech is perceived by the communication partner. So it's a subjective rating that varies depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to your parents, they know you really well, your speech intelligibility rating might be higher than if you're talking to a doctor or an unfamiliar person or a peer. Moving on to the term language understanding, Tana mentioned receptive language. Um, that's another term we use, and that is just how well you can listen and process auditory information. Language expression is the ability to acquire words, spoken words, and then to take those words and to put them into sentences with grammar and syntax, right? We call that sentence structure. And then to take those sentences and put them together to create stories, we call that um, narratives. And then have those sentences to engage in a back and forth conversation, and we call that discourse. Finally, the last term on this slide is social communication. And this is knowing how the rules of communication apply. So knowing that you're going to say things to your grandparents in a different way that you would say to your peers or knowing how to start and um, maintain a conversation without interrupting with like taking turns. This term, all, this term also includes um, why we talk. So we talk for lots of different reasons or purposes. We talk to request, to comment, to share a story, to ask a question, 
uh, to engage others in a back and forth conversation. So I wanted to insert this slide just for a moment to talk a little bit about the research on communication in GMFCS levels. Um, the research is really varied um, and um, not super clear. Um, the best um, distillation of that is that there's significant variability in uh, the communication skills of kids and how that relates to GMFCS levels. And so it's we need to be cautious uh, to draw conclusions on the basis of gross motor development. And the takeaway for me is that GMFCS does not determine potential. In other words, and there's so many variables and systems that interplay here that a child who may be at GMFCS 1, 2, or 3 may have um, great communication skills or may have really impacted communication. And conversely, a child who is at GMFCS levels 4 and 5 um, may also have the ability to be a great um, communicator. So we're going to take each of those five buckets and break them down and talk about typically developing children and then children with cerebral palsy and what the research says about skill development. So we're going to start with speech and speech development. For children with cerebral palsy, we know that there are differences and delays in speech sound acquisition. So what this means is a child, a typically developing child might have some sounds that they start to babble with at uh, you know, three to six months of age. Um, that, uh, that is gonna be happen later or delayed for a child with cerebral palsy. We also know that there are differences in how the sounds are acquired. Um, so for a typically developing child, they may have their first sounds as M or B or P. And for a child with cerebral palsy, let's say if they don't have that lip closure, those are not gonna be their first developing sounds. So there are differences and delays in speech sound acquisition. A couple other terms that apply here, um, there are, motor influences for cerebral palsy. The term dysarthria is used um, for muscle or motor weakness um, in, the, in the speech mechanism. And um, I often like to describe this, uh, although this is not um, a total description, but as the quality of being slushy or imprecise or harsh or strained. Um, and so we would call that, if there's a motor influence on speech, a dysarthria. And then another term that we also use is the term anarthria, and that is for kids who are nonverbal or who um, are not developing speech. Speech intelligibility, well, we know from typical child development that at the age of two, a child can be about 50% intelligible. By the age of three, that child can be 73% intelligible. And then by the age of four, that child is about 90% intelligible. Um, so most kids developing uh, who develop speech um, acquire their sounds and acquire words. And about age four, they have most of those. Uh, there's a few stragglers like S, L, R, T, H. Um, but by the age of eight, we would expect kids to be 100% intelligible to all communication partners. For children with uh, cerebral palsy, that speech intelligibility definitely impacts uh, their communication skills. For very young children, it's super hard to figure out what the influence is on communication. In other words, all kids are developing speech and they're developing their expressive language skills and they're developing the ability to be understood or to be intelligible to other people. And so we can't really parse out what's happening for these very young children with cerebral palsy because these are kind of interrelated systems. But what we do know is that there is an age of rapid growth for children with CP and this occurs between the ages of three and six years of age. For older kids, we know that speech intelligibility can 
be a significant factor to later language learning. Um, so let's think about that child who's in, in the age of eight with, and is 100% intelligible. While for a child with cerebral palsy, it, let's just say they're 80 or 90% intelligible uh, at the age of eight. Um, perhaps that's with their parents who are very familiar um, to the child's speech patterns. Um, an 80 to 90% intelligibility rating would be considered uh, a severe speech sound disorder. And furthermore, we know that that low intelligibility or any uh, decrease in intelligibility really affects that later lifelong lear uh, language learning. So that child may be more likely to um, uh, not talk or say the same things that people that they know the people will understand, or that child may um, not take risks or not try to say longer things because they know they're going to have trouble being understood. So that speech intelligibility piece definitely impacts language and expression, expressive language and social interaction. Pulling AAC back in, while AAC supports speech intelligibility, it can provide a voice, like Tana said, for those who are nonverbal, and then it can support communication when speech is difficult to understand. So it can be a supplement to a child who is speaking, but it has that low intelligibility. Moving on to language understanding or receptive language, I pulled one study from the research that looked at very young children at the age of 24 months. And uh, for this study, the children were broken into, they weren't broken, they were separated into three different groups. Um, an established talker group, an emergent talker group, and not yet talking. And so the, these kids were um, 24 months of age. And if you look at the diagram on the right side, the established talkers, um, their receptive language skills were about at age level. So for 24 months of age, they had uh, uh, testing receptive language skills at about 20 22, 23 months of age. So they were just about at age level. Um, for the kids who were emerging talkers or not yet talking, there's significantly more variability in their receptive language skills. Uh, and so my takeaway from this study is that early word acquisition uh, is a positive indicator for predicting um, typical receptive language development. Language expression for children with cerebral palsy. Um, the research is pretty clear that by the age of four and a half years, three out of every four children with cerebral palsy will show expressive language delays, uh, which is, I think, worth pausing um, and, and thinking about that. Um, that that's the majority of kids with CP will, will show uh, language delays. Uh, these language delays can persist into later um, childhood, teenager, early adulthood, adulthood, uh, and they can have a significant interaction with uh, um, communication with other systems. So that last bullet point um, is really trying to bring in that these delays, uh, they, so they can um, be worked on in speech therapy, but they're influenced by so many other systems. So for example, if a child has a vision impairment or a hearing impairment or a seizure disorder, um, or um, thinking about some of our earlier discussions about um, environmental and personal factors like um, lack of stable housing or financial insecurity or like uh, all of these different factors, these systems influence a child's ability to have language experiences. Um, and so these delays, these language delays and communication delays um, can really persist and other systems um, really kind of add to that mix of why. Um, finally, there's the social communication development for kids with CP. Um, and one research uh, researcher, Pennington in particular, um, talks a lot about learned helplessness um, or passivity. And learned helplessness is uh, definitely an alarming term. Um, so I want to explain that a little bit. Um, 
but the what happens with kids with CP is if they have difficulty being understood or expressing themselves, then that's going to influence how their partners interact with them. Um, so for all of us who interact with um, ki kids with CP, we may be in a rush, we may ask yes, no questions, and um, that then doesn't give the child a chance to really fully express themselves and they fall into a more passive role. Um, this in turn can limit their social competence because then they don't get to practice initiating conversations, communicating in longer utterances, the timing of a back and forth conversation. So pulling AAC back in again, AAC supports language and social development. Well, how does it do this? Um, well, early on for those very young kids, AAC can let kids babble. Uh, so that early speech and language development where kids are playing with sounds and words and, and how silly sounds and words are, well, that happens on speech generating devices as well. Um, AAC allows kids to then participate in a variety of language experiences and isn't reliant then on a partner leading a conversation. AAC supports social interactions with that range of partners. So for people who are very familiar with that child, they can then now have, they don't have to just rely on those yes, no questions. They can, um, the AAC can allow the child to have access to more language. And because of all of that, it supports greater autonomy and greater self-determination for that child. Ha, okay. Uh, so that was the language, the speech, language, and communication overview of uh, the development um, of those skills for kids with CP. But now we're gonna move into who uses AAC. Uh, and I, I love just this collage of joy on the screen where there's all these um, kids in various forms of communication. So I'm gonna point out a few different features in all these pictures. Um, I think the first thing I wanna point out is that there's a range of ages. AAC can be used for the very young children uh, versus all the way up through adulthood. Um, AAC use can be unaided, uh, like Tana said, so the boy in the bottom with his hands up uh, or the girl in the top, uh, top middle with her thumbs up um, versus aided. And so what you see here is the stuff, the AAC stuff uh, that is aided AAC. Um, some of these pictures show kids using uh, pictures, meaning they're not yet reading, but they can build their communication skills by interacting with picture symbols. And some of these pictures are using text where uh, the child or teenagers are studying and they're typing. Um, it's hard to get a flavor through just a picture. So I'll point out to you that there's a range of uh, partners and locations, right? So AAC happens everywhere. Uh, if we look at that boy in the bottom left with his hands up, well, he could be at a coffee shop with his mom and dad and his dad goes to the bathroom and the boy says, where's dad going? You know, with his hands, right? Um, so he's interacting out in the community and he's interacting with his parents. If you look at the picture above him, the boy it, with the glasses, he has a picture schedule that looks like he's building his language understanding or receptive language for a sequence. I think it's probably going potty. Um, so taking off, you know, changing your clothes, it looks like on those pictures. Um, and uh, he is likely uh, at home with his mom and his mom is trying to explain to him, hey, these are the steps in this sequence. Above that is a girl in a red shirt and uh, you'll see that she is at school and we know that because to her right is a phonics lesson. Uh, it's black and white, has a little hat on it. Um, my thinking is she probably has some sort of a, a 
uh, vision impairment, and that's why the materials were adapted for her so she could see them better. And then to her left is a picture communication system. Uh, and then above that, uh, the boy with the uh, blonde curly hair is engaged in school in a math lesson, right? So these pictures, I'm um, hoping to give you an example of how AAC can be used at home, at school, uh, and for a variety of, of um, activities. The, the last thing I want to point out to you, I think is probably the most important, and this is a term that we call access mode. Um, so if you if you can't speak, if you can't use your voice um, or you have difficulty using your voice, we want to figure out a way for you to access AAC. So for some kids, they can use their hands. Um, and let's see if you look at the boy in the top left uh, with the blonde hair, he's using his hand and he's touching some uh, numbers for that math lesson. So he has the use of his hands. Um, if you don't have use of your hands, you might use your eyes for communication. Uh, so going back to that girl with the phonics lesson, um, she's interacting with a communication device where she is using her eyes and her eyes are calibrated to that computer screen so that she can communicate by looking at those pictures. If you skip all the way over to the right, the top right, um, the girl with the glasses, she's also using her eyes, but she's using light tech uh, where she is looking at pictures of, uh, I think, hurt and sick. Uh, so a vocabulary lesson by her teacher. Uh, if you can't use your eyes or your hands, then let's talk about switches, right? So um, there's a girl on the right side with a blue bow. Uh, and she has a switch, uh, a little button on the side of her head, and she is able to communicate by moving her head and hitting that switch and then operating her computer, her communication system. Um, finally, uh, two other pictures I'll point out. The young woman in the bottom middle, she has two switches on each side of her head and she is literate. And so she's typing out, I use my two switches to select the icons on my Pathfinder, which is her communication system. And then the last picture is a kind of a goofy picture. I apologize. I had trouble finding a good picture. Um, but what I wanted to point out was for some kids, um, using your hands and your eyes and uh, switches is really challenging, but why not your feet? Uh, and and so in this picture, there's a young man and there's his foot and he's using his toes to type on a touch screen. Uh, Tana, do you have anything you wanted to add for all of these uh, pictures? No, I think you did a great job and they brought a smile to my face, so thank you. Back okay. to you. All righty, so I'm gonna pick back up here on um, Kind of rounding us to okay, we we know about what AAC is and some ideas of what kind of technology or strategies are there um, and who might use it and why, but we probably need to know well where where do we start in this process? And so we would encourage um, everyone to start with a current SLP that's working with a child. If the child's not working with an SLP, we really would love for you to connect with an SLP who has some knowledge and experience with AAC. Um, and with children who have motor impairments. We realize this can sometimes be hard to find, um, but it is really a good point to, to emphasize when it comes to having a successful journey with implementing AC is really starting with an SLP um, and having those conversations about his or her experience and knowledge with children who have motor impairments. We also need to start with an appropriate assessment. Um, there is specific assessment strategies that we encourage for children who may benefit from AEC, um, and they are different from a traditional speech and language assessment that might take place um, maybe in an early intervention center or in a school district. And so it's very important to obtain that most appropriate assessment regarding the technology and strategies that could support the communication needs of that child. We encourage as well some um, frequent and consistent engagement 
inappropriate speech and language intervention. And um, we know that um, we need our kids to have very frequent interactions with these skills that they're practicing. Um, AAC included, and so having those frequent sessions and interactions with a qualified professional is really, really important. And then as we're working on skills with AAC, we need to remember to constantly reassess skills and needs. Uh, you don't just get one AAC assessment and then call it a day. It really is something that happens in a dynamic fashion over the course of a child's development. That child's skills and their physical body, um, their context of communication, their partners, all of those things are very dynamic. And so our care needs to be dynamic and we need to be reassessing the situation on a frequent basis. We also really emphasize the need to build a team. Um, as an SLP, I don't know everything about every system that a child with cerebral palsy needs to have. Um, supported, right? So we may not get everything that we need in one place and each team member brings a unique set of skills and knowledge to the table. Uh, when we have communicators uh, such as children with CP, they have really complex bodies, really complex needs. Um, and so we need a team approach to really help us collaborate and give the best care. When considering some of the people that should be on your team, you really need to consider what the child's needs are. Um, at the very heart of it, we know the family is going to head an AAC team. They're really going to drive the goals and focus of that functional communication for a child. We need an SLP who is knowledgeable and skilled in AAC, and likely a PT and an OT are going to be at the core of that AAC team to really help us work through some of those physical challenges that are going to come with, as Marcy said, accessing um, the tools that we need to have supported communication. Who else would be on the team is certainly going to depend on where that child is in their life. If yeah, he or she has vision impairments, we definitely want to have ophthalmology, a teacher of the visually impaired, an OT with vision specialties on our team. If that child's of education age, we want their educator to be on the team and, and perhaps even their paraeducator, who is likely a, a familiar partner that spends a lot of time with that child. Um, and likewise, if uh, the child has a hearing impairment, we want audiology on the team or anyone in the deaf community who might be working on other forms of AAC, such as signing with that child should be a part of the AAC team. Next slide, please. Let's take a moment here to talk about briefly some factors that have a positive influence on outcomes with AAC intervention. And the very first one really is personal characteristics of that child. So things like how socially motivated a child is, how motivated they are to communicate can really have a positive impact on their long-term outcomes with using AAC to do so. We also know that high quality AAC and SLP services are really essential to um, positive outcomes. We want a professional and a team of professionals who are knowledgeable, um, have experience, and at the very minimum have a willingness to keep learning because this is a very complex situation and it isn't really possible to know everything about it all at once. So we really wanna find individuals that are interested and understand the importance of continued learning. And again, we want consistent contact and a collaborative, collaborative approach from our, from our highly skilled and quality professionals. We know that parent, family, and community support is also really important. Uh, families and children who are surrounded by a network really have a better foundation for the hard work ahead in learning how to communicate with AAC. Attitudes and cultural influences also can have a positive or challenging impact on outcomes with AAC, um, as can just a general access or comfort with technology itself. So our role um, when we support individuals and families in AAC is really to also help with the outreach and advocacy piece that might help to kind of lower some of these barriers, the ones that we can perhaps control, and how to support some of the other things that we know are positives, such as encouraging uh, motivation to communicate and supporting social drive in children, which is really a related skill to AAC. Marcy, do you have anything that you would add here about positive um, influences to outcomes? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I so appreciate this slide and your summary, Tana, and I wanted to give a shout out to the presenters this morning who talked about the ICF model. Um, I think that communication is all about 
function and functional outcomes and the research on when AAC is successful and when it is not successful really um, proves this to be true, that we have to consider the parents' priorities and the uh, that you can't just take the device like you're going to do that surgery and put it in the home and expect, you know, voila, this to be a, a magic fix that this the the equipment is tied to um, the priorities for the parent, um, the function of communication as it relates to participating in daily activities. Thanks, Tana. I'll turn the um, slide for us. Thank you so much. Um, and we just kind of included this poem here to really give you all a sense of um, a individual with CP's own journey with finding power in AAC. Um, we don't have the time for me to read it aloud, but you have it in your slides and I encourage you to read it. Um, this author is actually um, a prominent mentor in the assistive technology field. Uh, if you look up her name, you'll find some of the wonderful work that she's doing. But at the very least, this poem really gives you a nice uh, insight into how powerful AAC was for her in her journey in her life. Next slide, please, Marcy. Thank you so much. Uh, so we kind of wanted to wrap up today by introducing you to Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina is a young adult with cerebral palsy and also an AAC user. Uh, and we'd love to share just a few minutes um, of her journey with you via a video. I started using AAC when I was in preschool and have been using it since it helps me to express myself in every way. Do you think it was hard or easy or something in between to learn how to use AAC? Easy. It feels good to communicate with AAC because I can make myself understood. Communication is important to me because without it I can't talk. My Dynavox helps me achieve this by speaking my thoughts and ideas for me. Sometimes my Dynavox says words incorrectly. The battery doesn't last long. Also trying to talk on the phone, it's difficult for people to understand my Dynavox. My advice to parents is be patient and work along with your child and help them learn. All teachers need to take a course on AAC. Give students with AAC extra time to answer questions. Poor speech therapists get to know AAC more. I would like to share this quote I found on Jordan's Facebook Thank you. page. You can stop the video For those now. who don't know who Jordan is, he is a person with apraxia and he came. Thank you so much. So Sabrina just shared a bit with us about her journey and um, you could hear a little bit of her technology. I'm hoping people can see me because my screen just got weird. <laughs> I made Marcy a presenter again so you can share. So. Oh, okay, I see, thank you. So um, we wanna wrap up here and just um, ask if there's any questions. We've also provided our contact information here on the screen for anybody who wishes to reach out. Um, and I know I thank everyone for their time and attention today on this topic. I'll turn it over to Marcy if she has any wrapping remarks for us. Thank you. Are there any questions for us? 
Yes, give me a second. I'm going to share my screen. I'll go Q and A. So our first question is, do children need to understand cause and effect before starting AAC? Do you want me to take that one? Okay. Um, the, uh, the short answer is uh, no, um, in part because we know that um, adults and the people in a child's uh, life are the, the people who model language and communication. Uh, and so even if your child is not yet showing, for example, the skill of cause and effect, it is possible to introduce AAC strategies and um, some systems to give them that exposure. And then what are your top three suggestions to get AAC support through IEP at school? <sighs> that's, a, that's a big question. I, um, Mercy, you have more school experience than I do. Well, I can let you start, sure. but I can also add my experience as an advocate in the past. Or, um, gosh, that is a big question. Um, I often advise families that the the way to go about ensuring that AAC is used with their child at school is to make sure that it is represented in the IEP. Um, and so there's a few different details or variables. For example, some, some schools will only say uh, multimodality or um, will use speech or sign language or AAC to do X, Y, Z. Um, but if your child is using a specific AAC system, um, if you can get that system written into the IEP, um, you have more um, kind of legal clout to then say, hey, I, I don't want my child to be doing all these other things. I want them to be using this one system. Um, so that that's one idea uh, is that uh, in either in the goals or in the accommodation section to make sure that the AAC system or the strategies and supports um, are listed. So if your child needs extra time to listen and process information, um, then that would go under an accommodation in the IEP. Anything you want to add, Tana? Yeah, I would briefly add that um, sometimes the struggle can just be getting the team to um, acknowledge that AEC is a need for a child. And so if that's really where you're finding yourself, um, I highly encourage approaching the conversation from the standpoint of language and, and that a child needs access to language as we talk today in order to have access to 99.9% .9 of the learning environment. Um, it is very difficult to learn how to read fluently if you do not have a strong language foundation, right? It's difficult to follow directions in class. It's difficult to participate in math discussions. And so um, talking about it from the standpoint of language and access to education could be a good place to start when you're advocating for someone to bring this to the table. Thank you. And then um, AAC devices are like, are are devices like iPads, how do you make it easier for a person that already has motor issues to carry around and use the AAC device? Why don't I start, Tana, and then you can pick up. Sure. Um, there are lots of different kinds of tablets. There are iPads, and then as Tana mentioned, there are speech generating devices that are dedicated or specific to just communication. and. For children who have motor impairments, there's different ways to access those, um, those, those equipment. So for some kids, if there's some spasticity, we could lay a plastic grid on top of the iPad that would allow them to uh, uh, kind of guide their finger. Um, 
for kids who can't carry it around, there's a lot of different mounting options for mounting it to uh, a wheelchair or a table. Um, and what else can you think of? Yeah, I would say it's it definitely depends on the nature of the child's motor challenges, right? Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to live in a time where AEC systems have significantly slimmed down. And it is very uh, easy to find a system for the most part that is pretty portable. Sometimes shoulder straps can work out for kids who don't do as well holding with their hands. Um, fanny packs style carrying cases. So a lot of wonderful add ons to help a child who's able to carry carry. And then as Marcy said, also some really great mounting options. And sometimes those are mounting options that come through wheelchair collaborations and other times they might be mounting options that are off the shelf at Amazon uh, for different purposes. And those mounting options can also support better access uh, by getting that system in the appropriate position for the child to use their body in the most um, maximized way that he or she can. All right, and then often in PT, parents do not bring the child's AAC device. Should we encourage them to use or leave that decision up to parents? And parents may say it takes too long to use, et cetera. Yes. But remember that communication is multimodal. And so um, I would have a dialogue with that parent and uh, ask a little bit more about why uh, the device is not coming to session. Talk about some of the communication opportunities that happen in your PT session and some ways to support those if the device is not the best way to do so. Marcy, would you add anything to that? Um, just that um, really inquiring why the parents, you know, help uh, why the parents said uh, that it takes too long to use. Um, what is the barrier? Uh, is that device the best device? Perhaps this would be our last question. How fast can AAC users communicate compared to typical speech? Oh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, Tana. Do you? It's slow. It's very slow. I don't have all the numbers. I do have one number. I was just talking to a colleague the other day. Um, we speak at about 120 to 130 words per minute verbally. She has a colleague who's a prominent AAC user, adult user, who uh, communicates with his device at 40 words per minute. That doesn't mean there isn't somebody faster, but I think it illustrates the large discrepancy that even at best, AAC is very slow. Well, I don't have any more questions coming in. If um, folks are typing in their questions, we have just another minute or so um, for you to submit your questions. Um, Marcy and Tana, I'm not sure if you're going to stay for the Q&A section. You're uh, welcome to stay for the rest of the conference and seminar. Um, I'll be around. Great. Thank you so much.